after, I'd like just to remind you that at 3.15, we have a panel on career, careers path here. So I think it, 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 it will be a good discussion, so please stay tuned. And uh, now we have the lecture by uh, John Gong uh, Ha. And uh, he was uh, PhD, uh, he did his PhD in, at Caltech, then he passed uh, as a postdoc at MIT, and now he's a senior researcher at, uh, at Microsoft. And he'll tell us about uh, topological codes. Thank you. Um, very glad to be in front of the future enthusiast in quantum computing. Um, the, my general title of the, this mini course was Topological Aspects of Quantum Codes. Now, you may wonder, topology, uh, what's topology? Well, technically, it's a, satisfied by the four axioms, the empty set and the total set, uh, arbitrary union or the finite intersection are all, all in the topology. It's a collection. Speak a little louder. Oh. I can barely hear you. Uh, is it, does it break better? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so in mathematics, topology has a very specific meaning. Uh, it is a collection of open sets. And you, well, it's a definition of what open set means. But uh, the definition has now become somewhat much broader. And now when people talk about topological codes or topological phase in physics or uh, uh, coding literature, it no longer means refers to any open sets, but rather um, some phenomena that you want to see uh, that has a discrete nature out of many small consti constituents. But that's precisely what topology is about. You are defining the topological spaces by a, my, my, a local data, and then you, you wonder about the global structure, and you end up deriving some discrete data out of that, the topological invariance. So in that sense, it is called uh, topological. Um, so I hope you have some sense what the topological, the word adjective or topological has been used in the literature after these four hours. Um, so let me, so this is a rough uh, uh, plan. Uh, in the, for today, we're gonna derive some bounds on the local codes. Of course, I will define what local codes are. And then we'll talk about the one canonical example of topological codes, the toric code, and introduce the connection to the homology. You, I do not assume your knowledge about homology, so don't be afraid if you don't know. And then in the third, uh, third hour, uh, I will dis, uh, explain, uh, we will <coughs> uh, look into the complexity of generation of a particular code states. So this is uh, akin to the complexity theoretic questions, namely there's an object that you wanna estimate the quantity of, and then <coughs> you wanna uh, uh, show that it is hard in, various, in, in a variety of metrics. And uh, we will see uh, such an instance, in this case, the, the, the <coughs> number of local gates elements to create the target state from a trivial state. And then in the fourth hour, we will uh, delve in a slightly, uh, 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 switch the gear and talk about the transversal gates, uh, primarily focused on the T gates. Uh, there is a topological element, so I, so I included this. So uh, roughly speaking, the local codes, this is not a really a technical term, so I don't have to write, that, write down anything. Local codes means that a code that is defined by local data. That's all it means. Uh, you have to figure out what it means to be local. Uh, I think throughout my hours, uh, the local means that you have uh, some metric space uh, in game, a very specific metric space, uh, usually a, a plane or a line, so some low dimensional Euclidean space you can think of, then that's enough. And in that context, the local means that something that acts or probes uh, some nearby degrees of freedom, nearby few qubits. This is different uh, from the local Hamiltonian that you heard in the first hour of today in the Sandy's talk, that uh, there local refers to just uh, some operator acts on a few qubits. There's no underlying metric space your notion of locality is just a number local. Here, I assume geometric locality. There is an underlying metric space, always. Okay, let's start with a, a classical singleton bound. Uh, it's a crude bound. A singleton is a name. Um, <coughs> it reads... Uh, 
there are more general versions, but um, let me just uh, uh, focus on the linear codes. So classically, a linear code, oh, oh, this is, by the way, definition. A linear code is a linear subspace in your binary vector space. That's it. That's the linear code. So obviously, there's a zero element. Uh, there's some, some non-zero elements. And every element in C will have some zeros and ones and so on. And the people speak of minimal distance. Minimal distance between any two elements in this, in this set, in this, in this C. But what do, what do you mean by distance? I, well, this is not a metric space yet. The distance I, here I mean the Hamming distance. So the Hamming weight of a vector is just the number of ones. In. That's it. And the, the distance between two things is going to be the Hamming weight of the, the sum of the two. Well, since we're working with the binary field, there is no distinction between subtraction and addition. They're the same thing. So you count the number of positions, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, the, that the, when, where V and W are different. And uh, <clears throat> um, since it, this is a linear code, uh, the minimum distance is going to be the minimum uh, the minimum weight of a non-zero vector, which is the distance from the all-zero vector to a non-zero vector. So that parameter is the d, minimum distance of c. And n is the ambient dimension, n, the number of components in a column. k is the linear space dimension of c. That's it. And the singleton bound reads that your distance cannot be too large if your code is encoding large number of classical bits. Why is that? Um, I drew a column vector, but let me write it in a row vector. So this is a typical element, well, some, some general element of C. And then imagine that we just cross out a few bits. How many? I want to cross out D minus one bits. You just enumerate all the all elements in the in the in the linear space, and then just erase them, and look at the remaining part. Okay, can there be any collision? Collision meaning that uh, after erasure, the two vectors look uh, look exactly the same. It's a yes or no question. No, right? Why? Because by definition, if, if there were collision here, then they are the same, so they can only differ in these coordinates, but the number of them is d minus one, less than the minimum distance, violating the def definition of d. So there is no collision, so you have a map from, map from c down to f to the n minus, how many coordinates did I delete? d minus one. And this map is injective. So the dimension in the domain must be, at most, the dimension in the co-domain. And that's the singleton bound. Now, this is a purely classical one. Um, and there's a quantum analog. And that, and that one we want to, well, we want to prove. So the quantum singleton bound reads that two times the co-distance is less than n minus k. Now, I did not define what the quantum code is, but it is now, uh, you can, if you can rem remember Nicholas' talk last week, then I, I'm, I'm using the same definition. So, Uh, I'm, I'm only thinking about the Pauli stabilizer code. Uh, it is defined to be, oops, yeah, defined by a group of Pauli matrices. <coughs> I'm sorry, the group of uh, tensor product of Pauli matrices. There will be some number of generators, and they they should all be commuting 
and there should not contain minus identity. That's the definition of a poly stabilizer code. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the number of generators for the poly stabilizer group has a simple relation with the number of encoded qubits that it's that that reads like this. The number of encoded qubits is exactly the ambient number of qubits minus the number of constraints. So that's I'm, I'm, I'm just reviewing what Nicola has told you last week. Um, so in this context, we have n and k well defined. N is the number of qubits. K is the number of logical qubits encoded in that code space given by this formula. And d is something different. And previously, d was just the minimum distance between any distinct two elements. In the quantum setting, similar thing holds, but now the interpretation is different. Here, the, it was a code word themselves. Here, we're talking about the logical operators. So logical operator is going to be the commutant of the poly stabilizer group in the group of full, uh, full poly operators, full group of poly operators, and, and the logical operator is identified with the, with the, uh, uh, with the all poly operators that commutes with the stabilizer. That's the definition. And of course, the, the meaningful part that you want to focus on is the modulo stabilizers. Um, so D here is going to be the Hemming weight difference, the positions of number of qubits where two logical operators differ in their power uh, tensor components. That's the distance. It's the same definition as Nicola has used last week. So we have all the definitions of those three parameters and we get uh, inequality, that's the claim of the uh, uh, quantum singleton bound. And the difference from the classical case is that there's a, a coefficient two. Um, two appears in many places in quantum setting when you compare it to classical one, and this is one instance. <coughs> So our, my, my first goal is to prove that inequality. And the more important is, the, is not the inequality itself, but the derivation. The, there's a recurring theme of ideas that applies to der in deriving those inequality. Um, so to that end, I want to introduce what is called cleaning lemma. Uh, statement is this. Um, so we have some number of qubits. Oh, by the way, I, I draw a square, but there's no uh, metric space underlying yet. Uh, whenever there is, I will mention it, so don't worry. So there is a, suppose there's an n qubit. And suppose I have some collection of qubits, some subset of qubits called A. And I, and I demand that, I assume that A is Correctable. I'll be speaking of the word correctable many times, and here is the definition. Um, any uh, logical operator supported on A, it has to be the stabilizer itself. It's a, it's a property of A. Uh, realized through the, all the logical operators supported on, on, on the region A. And I demand that the condition is that it has to be a stabilizer. An equivalent definition is to think of the, the code space projector. Um, If you, have, and if you have studied any representation theory, then this formula might be uh, very familiar to you. It's the sum of all elements in a group normalized by the group order. You can show that this is, and whenever it is represented as, a, as a, some unitary representation, and which is, because uh, the uh, poly stabilizer group is a, is a subgroup of poly group. Uh, it is a un, each G is a unitary, and I'm taking a linear combination of unitaries. Um, you can show that this is a Hermitian and this is a projector. So this is my code state projector. 
Um, an equivalent condition is that So whatever operator you give me, not necessarily poly, whatever operator you give me that is supported on A, acting on A, and tensored with identity else elsewhere, I do not write identity components. Sandwiched by the code speed projector is on some operator, some, some, some large matrix, you know, two to the n by two to the n matrix. It's going to be a scalar multiple of the projector itself. So, when you read this equation as a, as a map, so I project down to the code space, I apply some, the given operator, and I project back to the code space, then the overall action is, well, I remain the same as I started, but the action was just a scalar multiplication. The most boring operation you can think of. Yes. No. Um, supported means that, you know, if you have a bipartite system, say A and B, then how do you construct the operator algebra on, on acting on those? You take uh, all the matrices acting on A, all the matrices acting on B, and you take the tensor product of the two matrix algebras. So what is O of A? O of A means that it, it may be, uh, be non-trivial on A, but it has to be identity on B. That means, yeah, that, that, that's the definition of when I say an operator is supported on A. No, A is a subset of qubits. Yeah. There was another question somewhere. No, okay. Yeah. Um, Mm, it was not planned, but let me just prove this, the equivalence, because um, that's going to be recurring afterwards, I think. So I think it's important. Oh. Yeah, okay, that, that, that'll work better. Um, so, uh, yeah. Whenever you can encounter operator equality in the context of poly stabilizer codes, think about the expansion. So the one nice thing about the well, if this is a, actually very reason why people first invented the poly stabilizer code. Poly operators form an operator basis. You can write down any operator as a linear combination of some poly operator acting on the whole system. In this case, now it, they are all, each of them is acting on A, supported on A. Sorry, I, now, not, now I'm mixing up the subscript versus superscript, but I'm sure you understand that. <coughs> now suppose I have that, oh, yeah. Let's calculate this quantity, sandwiching the, the code space projectors. That's the trivial linearity. Now, it's a projector. So what can I do? I can, do, I can insert any element G from my stabilizer group. If you remember the, the sum over all elements formula, then since it's a group, whether you multiply some elements from the outside or not, you know, it, it stays the same. One plus. Uh huh. Ah. Oh 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 oh. Uh, separate the generators generating set versus the group. S is the group. So in particular, G may be identity. Yeah. So I can do the same thing here. 
in the projector, not, no, no, no problem. Another nice thing about polyam operators is that they either anti-commute or commute. There's no other possibility. So if PJ commuted with G, then it will just stay the same. If it anti-commuted, it will pick up minus sign. But how come, so the sum will be uh, uh, decomposed into two, two sums, one that commutes, one that anti-commutes. The anti-commute part may pick up minus sign whenever they want. How could that be possible if there is zero? Clear? I mean, if x plus y equals x minus y, how can it be true? y is zero. So the sum is constrained to the commuting operators only. Now then, p, p sub j a is all logical. But if I assume that A was correctable, then they all should be a stabilizer, which means they all are absorbed into pi. What you're left with is just a coefficients, and that's precisely that formula. And you can see the converse is also true in that way. So yeah, correctable means that either absence of non-trivial non, non logical operator on the region or the, uh, the action of the code space is scalar multiplication. All right, so that was a bit of a digression. Um, now let's get into the, the proof towards the cleaning lemma. I want to think of the, I want to decompose that my stabilizer group into three pieces. Those that are supported on, on region A and those that are supported on region B, the complement of A. Is there any intersection in between these two groups? Well, by definition, something has to be supported on A exclusively and at the same time uh, supported on B exclusively. So the only possibility is identity. So they are Dirac sum. And, oh, uh, right. Now the third component of nice thing about the poly matrix is we are working over the binary, binary cube bits, not arbitrary four dimensional space or six dimensional space. The two is a prime. So the stabilizer, poly stabilizer group or in general poly, uh, the group of poly operators, if you forget the, all the phase vectors, then it becomes a vector space. Multiplication in the operator corresponds to addition in that vector space modulo, because the commutation relation only gives you a sign, which we're ignoring. So it is a vector space, S, a subspace in that vector space. And the vector space is Im important that whenever you have a subspace, it is a direct complement. There, it, it is a direct cement. So there is a sum subgroup that complements this inclusion and becomes a e equality. Here, the, 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 that the fact that we are working over the cube bits is very important. Q treats fine, four dimensional degrees of freedom, not fine. All right, now. <clears throat> Sorry? SA is a subgroup of S consisting of those supported on A, only on A, B similarly. S prime is the direct complement. The choice of S prime is not unique in as much as you, know, you can take a, any uh, transverse subspace in a vector space. Um, yeah. Now I wanna consider the projection onto uh, a truncation map from the full poly group onto uh, the full poly group on a, restricted on N A. So whatever your poly operator give me, say x one, y two, I don't know, z three. If A is a the first qubit, then I, on, I only obtain x one and just erase the, the the latter part. In terms of vector space, I, I had uh, some components and I zeroed out except for the first component. So 
So let's apply this map to this. What happens? Obviously, the image will contain the, the, those already uh, uh, supported on A, and it will completely zero out this B part by definition. And so, so there is something that could come from this S prime piece. But is this part, I mean, the map from Is, is this map somewhat special? That's my first question. And I, my claim is that it is injective. Why? Well, we don't have to write anything here. If anything here becomes zero here, then by definition it means that it is support, the, the, the starting point was supported on B. Right? So it, it should belong here. So by definition then, S prime, the, the, whatever kernel it may be, it, it belongs to S prime intersect with S B, which is zero. So this map is injective, so this part survives. And the same applies for the B part too. Now let's do some uh, basic linear algebra. Where's my razor? Oh, that's my hand. Um, There could be a generated, well, there could be a component that straddles between the two. Like, um, so my stabilizer group, suppose, was generated by the single element, this. So it's an order of two group. And this is A and this is B. Then what is SA? Is there any element that is supported exclusively on A? No. What about B? Nothing. So the whole group is equal to S prime. <laughs> I didn't argue anything yet. I'm just, I'm just identifying that the image of under this pi of A on S is equal to this and that, and this space is isomorphic to original S prime. That's it, as a linear space. Now let's interpret, well, oh, I realized I didn't even state what the cleaning lemma is claiming. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let me do it here. So yeah, if A is correctable, then, this is the claim, then B supports uh, a, a complete set of representatives for logical operators. So whatever you want to do with the code, you have to access to the logical operator, and you can always do that by accessing only B part without ever touching A part. So why is, it, why is it cleaning? General, if you give me any logical operator arbitrarily, then it will be have some, com some component in A piece and some component in B piece. And I could, and since it has a complete set of representatives, you know, logical operators always comes in a, in a equivalence class, modulo S. So it means that I could always find the equivalent logical operator that is equivalent to the original one you give me, and that new thing is supported on the complement of A. Would it be better to call A detectable? Uh, more accurate to yeah, let's not argue with the terminology. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's widely called correctable. Um, all right, so yes. Complement. Yeah. So what does it mean to have a complete set of logical operators? It means that if you, if you look at the logical operators supported on B part, 
you find everything, and then you mod out by the stabilizer supported there, then that should be the number of logical qubits, right? So qu quantitatively, two times k, because one logical qubit is specified by the pair of logical operators, not one. Two times k should be equal to the dimension of How do you find the, uh, yes? Oh, oh. Does it better? Yeah. Yeah, how do you, how do you find the, how do you find the committent? If, if I give you an exercise sheet to find the logical operator, what, what, what would you do? It's a Gauss elimination. You write down the, all the bases for the uh, poly operator and you find the, uh, the kernel of that map. So, it's going to be linear equation solving, which means, uh, oh, uh, let, let me say again. So when, when, you, when you want to find a, a logical operator supported on a specific set, then you look for the restrictions of the stabilizer on that region, because that's all that counts. And you look for the commutant of that compile the operators and mod out by the trivial logical operator supported on that region. Yeah. Now the linear algebra part that I uh, alluded ar earlier is that you, you're solving linear equations and this, this qu the quantity in the parentheses is giving you the constraint. And where are you solving the linear system of equation? You're solving in the poly group supported on A, which has dimension two times the number of qubits in A. Clear? Oh. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Uh. Why is it always equal to 2K? Because, uh, oh, <laughs> that's the goal actually. Yeah, this is the goal, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, because the, the claim is that B is going to support everything, right? So I need to count the number of logical operators supported on B, which is A complement. Everywhere B, yeah, but let me, let me write B. Yeah. Okay. Yes, just dimension counting. On the other hand, you can do the same calculation for A part, and, and we know by assumption that the result must be zero. Why? Because I, I just assume that whatever logical operator is supported on A must be stabilizer. So zero is two A right? Let's add them up. So the quantity that we are interested is equal to zero plus the quantity, and that is two times I just abbreviated my notation to where the bracket means dimension. I just literally added two lines. That's it. But we, we have better idea about those quantities by that calculation. So what are they? They are, this is equal to SB part dimension of SB times dimension of S prime. This is equal to SA plus dimension of S prime. What? B. 
because P A on S prime is injective. Yeah, that that that's the place I I, I needed that. So now let's just the uh, a number of qubits in A plus number of qubits in B is the total number of qubits. S B appears one, two times. S A appears one, two times. S prime appears one, two. So the quantity we were wondering is exactly equal to 2k as promised. So that's the cleaning lemma. If you have a correctable region, then the complement have all the resource for you to do anything you want on the logical space. Now let's prove this quantum singleton bound. Um, the first step is to show that my number of qubits is at, at least twice as large the d to minus 1. Why? If not, I should be able to find a tri tripartition where this is less, this is uh, d minus 1. And this is d minus one, which is a pigeonhole principle. Now, d minus one is by definition smaller than d, <laughs> and d was supposed to be the minimum number of qubits that you have to access to enact any logical operation. So, b union c is correctable by definition of d. Similarly, a union b is also correctable. Now let's apply the cleaning lemma. Apply to A union B, the conclusion is that C alone supports the complete set of logical operators. By symmetry, A alone supports a complete set of logical operators. Now, if this code encoded any logical qubit, then I hand you, say, A part and send it to some other galaxy and I retain part C. The observer in, galaxy, in, in, the, in the distant galaxy can do whatever they want in the code space, and I can do whatever I want in the code space, but that's precisely what no, no, <coughs> no cloning theorem says impossible. So that's a contradiction. It's a consequence of the linearity of quantum mechanics. So this inequality is checked. Now, since I have a sufficiently large number of qubits, I can now define a tripartition, A, mm, for the consistency of later discussion, let me label A, C, B. And A alone consists of D minus one qubits, and B alone consists of D minus one qubits, and C is possibly empty, but you know, this configuration is feasible. Now comes an interesting part, some information theoretic argument. Suppose that I, I bring a reference system such that the code space is maximally entangled with my reference system. Reference system has no, uh, no special structure. It, it, it is just a just the c to the 2 to the k, just the k qubit worth of Hilbert space. And it's maximally entangled. <coughs> um, now I claim that the mutual information with respect to that maximally uh, mixed state, uh, I'm sorry, maximally entangled state between A and R is zero. 
And at the same time, the mutual information between B and the reference system is zero. That's my claims. How do I see that? Well, I don't know how to cal calculate the, the, the entropies of this abstractly given subsystem. That's too hard. But what I can show is that I can calculate the correlation function. Sorry? No, no, no. The, the, this is the first step in the proof. In the second, I'm, 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 doing the, I'm running the second step. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. R is maximally entangled with the code, code, code space. So you, you pick some, whatever uh, your favorite base is in your code space, and then write down the maximally entangled state with R. So, uh, physicists use the word correlation to mean a very specific thing. You, I have to prove. I have to provide uh, two observables, uh, O A and O B, and the correlation means that O A times O B, and you take a trace with the uh, expectation value with respect to the given state, minus. this quantity, uh, usually denoted as O, A, O, B. Some authors put a double bracket, some others don't. Uh, this is the correlation between O, A, and O, B, that def definition. I leave you an exercise that to show that if this vanishes for all O, A, and O, B, then the mutual information between is zero. This is your exercise. But let me just explain why this should vanish. Rho being the maximally entangled in the code space means that my code space projector commutes with rho, and moreover, it is absorbent. You know, it's a state. I just hit it with the projector. It does nothing because my state is already there. But it's more than just words because now, you know, pi times rho is an unphysical quantity as an operator, but uh, yeah, mathematically it makes sense. So what, then what, what can I do? I can insert pi here and there, and using cyclicity of trace, I can move this pi over here. Oh, uh, let me change b to r, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pi and R does not have any overlap. They are just completely different things. So pi moves over. Ah, now we get the familiar quantity. You know, we remember the correctable, correctable criteria means that operator sandwiched by the projector is scalar multiple of the projector. So this whole thing becomes scalar. And you do the same thing here, and you show that it is zero. Okay, so the mutual information becomes zero between cor correct origin and the reference system. Now you do the usual information theory tricks. Yes. Sir, what is the parameter rho in this information? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, you know, the mutual information, oh, uh, you take Oh yeah, I, actually I needed that ex whole expansion. So <laughs> this is zero, and the, this similarly, this is zero. Now, well, let's specialize. We know this quantity. It's a, it's a reduced density matrix on the reference system that has no structure. But all we know is that it is maximally entangled with the, rep, with, with, with the rest. What's the entanglement entropy of the maximally entangled states? It's that dimension. Well, log dimension. So 
this quantity is e equal to k. And the whole state, the maximum entangled state, is a pure state. One nice thing about the quantum phenomenon entropy is that if it's a pure state, the, the entropy of a region is equal to the entropy of the complement. So AR, what's the complement? BC. BR complement is AC. Now everything is e expressed in terms of A, B, C, and K. So after some manipulation, um, which I'm not going to do because it well, yeah, you just add them at 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 the two, and then apply the inequality that this is less than an absolute value, less than the less than b times the sum of the two entropies of the of the uh, participating regions. It's a subadditivity of, of entropy. <clears throat> the conclusion is that the K is less than or equal to the entropy of C. But how large can the uh, entropy of C be? I erase the D minus one part, another D minus one part, and so the number of qubits in C is N minus two times d minus one, and that's the maximum um, entropy possible, and this inequality is proved. Um, so far, there's no locality or anything, but now let's apply this to uh, local code on, on the torus, and that will be today's hour. Yes. Four B. Yes. Ah. Oh. Ah. Uh. Yeah. There. There are just a local variable that stands for generic region. I. Uh, there's no consistency over the hour, sorry. ABC a, a, is literally just this tripartition where the co only condition is that A consists of D minus one qubits, B consists of D minus one qubits, that's it. Um, cleaning lemma is used in the first step. Uh, I th oh yeah, here. Cleaning lemma is just used here. Without this, this step, I could not have this three tripartition, which did, did, didn't make sense. Yeah. So what did you prove in the second step? What did I prove in the second step? The, this. Uh, well, more importantly, this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so let's exploit this the idea in the second step because uh, yeah. Dimension of the system R is two to the k. And the entropy in on R is K. Yeah. That yeah. So you start with N minus one. So you should start with the dimension of the system C as the No, I did not put any restriction on the size of C. C is just uh, possibly zero, but you know, it's the it's a, it's allowed tripartition. And then I considered, well, so the, the introduction of the maximally entangled state with the reference system is a completely uh, uh, argument's sake. Um, there's no, it's not, it's not given in, in the problem. Um, but by introducing the reference system, I was able to 
relate the, the co-speed dimension with entropy. That's the, that's the step. So, well, the cleaning lemma was important in the first step, but I find the, the idea in the second step more interesting, that you can relate the dimension of a co-space by, by the entropy of uh, some auxiliary volume that is complement of a true correctable region. So let's imagine that now we get a, a torus. So this is torus, two torus. And I divide the system into three pieces. So it's a torus, so it's a periodically identified. A1 is a, a disk-like region. A2 is its own a disk like region, B1 and B2. And C has four components, C2, I left you to a uh, uh, joyful hour to, to imagine this into you know, to a torus embedding in three, three space. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just arbitrarily divided the, my like, two torus region like this. And I, let me introduce a, an interesting assumption. Uh, you may wonder, where, why do you assume this? But let me just assume it anyway. Let me assume that a region A, well, let me read uh, region M, Assume that M is correctable whenever, if you take a small distance neighborhood of M. Now we're talking about metric space, so there's underlying metric. The torus is a, is a nice metric, as you see. If you take a, <coughs> if, if this is, was M, then you take a small neighborhood around M. So you literally uh, uh, collect all the points that are distance R or less from M. Let me assume that if this thickened M is homeomorphic to a disk, then I say, I assume that M itself is correctable. You may think it is too strong, or you may, we, we can argue about the, the well, this is an assumption. Then what happens? Then what happens? A1, well, if you thicken a little bit, It will creep into like this. This is the R neighborhood of A1. That's, that's disk, right? So A1 is correctable. Similarly for A1, A2, AB1, B2. So all ABs are correctable individually. Now let's maybe I'll assume one thing more. Suppose my, it was my, uh, my code is defined by the local stabilizer generators. Meaning that in every generator in my stabilizer group is supported on a, on a disk-like region of diameter, say, R, where R is some fixed number. I'm talking about a torus, and I'm imagining tor toric code. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where did I put the razor? Um, oh.
Now let's back up a little bit, and then I want to I want to exploit the fact that my code is locally uh, it has a locally generated stabilizer group, and the consequence of that. So my system is roughly like this, where A1 and A2 are individually correctable. Now I ask, what about the union? I claim that if they are sufficiently far separated, then the union is also correctable. Why? If there were a logical operator supported on the union, then it is a poly operator. So it has a tensor component that is supported here and, and, and there. Now, the assumption that P is a logical operator means that it commutes with every generator of my stabilizer group. But where's the generator? Generator can see like only A1 piece or only A2 piece, but never simultaneously. The commutation relation should, should hold individually. So it means that A1 must be, must be the logical operator too, and A2 must be the logical operator as well. But we know by assumption, by, by this assumption, that A1 is correctable, so this is trivial. A2 is correctable, so this is trivial. Now, P was a product of the, of the two trivial operators, so P has to be trivial as well. So I show that the union is correctable whenever they are separated, whenever they are not acted upon by any generator of your stabilizer group. So A1 union A2 is correctable, a B1 union B2 is correctable. Now you recall this inequality. In the step two, I did not use anything but the fact that A and B are both correctable individually. Now I have two subsystems that are each correctable. So the, the code, space, code space dimension, the number of logical qubits is bounded by the volume of C which happens to be four component set, but the number of qubits in C bounds in the number of logical qubits. So, and what's the size of this C? What, what, what was the requirement that I introduced C? It was needed because I, I want to take a, a fattened version of A's, and whenever they are, they, they, they do not intrude the other part, then we're fine. So A, C, the size of C, each, 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 each blob, has to be only order of this R, the size of the stabilizer group. I'm sorry, the generator. So if that size is constant, then you can only encode a constant number of logical qubits no matter how large your torus can be. Remember the two, con two conditions. I assume that, I assume the correctability based on the topology of the region you're considering. A slightly fattened but ones should be a ball. And I, and I also assume the locality of the stabilizer generator. Let's do another example for, uh, oh, I'm over, uh, oh, actually, this is time. Um, I, heard that there are some people in the audience who are studying quantum topology, and this example might interest you. Let's consider a sphere. Uh, the argument will work in arbitrary dimension, but let's, for the sake of concreteness, let me just focus on two sphere. Um, consider the northern hemisphere. Topologically, this is a disk, and our neighborhood is also a disk, so northern hemisphere is correctable. What about the southern hemisphere? The same thing. So both 
hemispheres are correctable, and I have managed to divide the whole system into two correctable regions, leaving nothing behind. Number of logical encoded qubits under the, those two conditions that your um, correctable region inherits some topology of the region, uh, uh, and the fact that my code is locally generated, then on sphere you cannot encode any qubit. It has to be just unique state. No. Where did I use? Well, A and B didn't have any, any space in, in between. The role of C was to separate the com different components of A. That's it. But on the, on the sphere, I was able to just use one region for A and another one disk for B. Yes? Can you describe your assumption again, please? Ah, so, sure. Um, so, Number two. Yeah. It's a it's an assumption. I mean, I I I I, I just consider. Uh, well, it is partly motivated by the lazy person's construction of local codes. What, what you, what you, you want some homogeneity, right? You, you don't want to introduce uh, too much data into uh, one construction. And uh, one, one convenient construction will lead you to such a uh, condition. The second condition is the, is the, is the definition for local codes in, 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 this, in this hour. Yes? What do you mean by the standard Oh, uh, well, not, maybe it's not a standard notation, but I, I literally mean So some met metric space, you collect the uh, points whose distance from M is less than or, or equal to R. Well, so if you the plus, well, <laughs> this would be a disk. But if I had, a, if my M was like this, then it will be something like this. If my region was like, like this, then it will be like that. A disk? Disk is anything that is homeomorphic to literal disk. <laughs> Region does not generate the code. Region is a part of the data, well, part of the data you want to investigate when you analyze a code. Code is defined by the, by the stabilizer group, and for which you have to specify the generators on. No, region is a, is a subset of the underlying space. which is whatever space you are considering. Here, the, the, the underlying space was a torus with a metric. Here, it was a two-sphere with a metric. It is not directly related. Code space is another construction on top of that underlying space. It's an extra data. <laughs> 